All right, let me see. I get this done. Mm -hmm. Share. All right. Are you seeing my, my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jimena, and, and all the people who uh, organized this, this webathon. Um, and uh, it's an interesting experience for me, so I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to the next hour. So uh, I'm, I'm Walter Chalier, I'm the chief of the Hernan Santa Cruz Library of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, United Nations. And um, we are based in Santiago de, de Chile. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, from open access to open science in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. Um, let me see. Right, so um, this is a very, this is a problem that we're all very familiar with, I think. Um, so research um, should be about trying to understand um, phenomena in, in, in nature. And, and this is a, a game with words that I'm gonna make and that is easier to make in, in English than in Spanish. Um, so, and. But what we often see in, in, in research is that we um, try to fit the, the narrative of our results in another nature, namely the, the, the journal nature. So we see that um, all researchers have a huge pressure to publish in those big international core journals and the higher the ranking, the better. And so we, we kind of sometimes lose out of sight what uh, research is really about. And something similar we see, uh, for example, in, in, this, uh, in, in these sentences, which are, is, is a, a real quotation uh, from the researcher, which is basically a kind of similar, you know, and um, this is a study about indigenous uh, community. And so the first thing that a researcher does is to check in literature whether there is any proof, uh, any validation that can be found in literature on, uh, on, on those indigenous communities. And, and so that's the kind of uh, turning research uh, upside down uh, because what we should do is to, to start from reality and uh, not use let's say, uh, necessarily literature as, um, as a way to, to validate uh, this reality. So um, I, I think we, we, we all agree that the traditional model of scholarly communication, as we know, is, is broken. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is that um, the scholarly communication is very much focused on let's say white men from um, from the northern hemisphere, and what we see that a lot of production from the southern hemisphere or from from other countries that are currently underrepresented do not necessarily get the attention in scholarly communication, do not necessarily get the opportunities in scholarly communication, the visibility um, that they deserve. And so this is something, what I already mentioned, this distinction between core and, and peripheral journals, which is uh, it's not good for science and, and the way we are doing uh, research. Now, there is a way out. This can be fixed and this should be fixed. And there are several initiatives already. And this is not a new thing. This is something that is going on for, I would say, at least 20 years already. Um, is that um, we are moving towards more open access uh, and now the last few years also towards more open data. And, and this is the big umbrella that we call uh, open science, which covers all that uh, open access, open data and uh, 
um, open research data, but also um, things like open methodologies, open software, open hardware, citizen science, etc., etc. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of changes happening in this uh, traditional system of scholarly communication, um, and 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 that's a good thing because um, we want to achieve more transparency, and and this. Um, inequality is, is something that um, several people are already working on. And when we focus on, on Latin America and the Caribbean, we already know that uh, like a year ago, Cielo celebrated its 20 years of existence. So Cielo was born as an initiative uh, to highlight uh, the production in Latin America and the, uh, the Caribbean the research uh, output. In, in this region. And there were several other initiatives uh, as a kind of alternative channel to the traditional um, scholarly communication channels. Um, and um, uh, obviously, I mean, the high prices that we all know and, and that make it rather difficult, not only for uh, um, uh, countries from the Southern Hemisphere, but increasingly also from, from many uh, top institutions from, uh, from the Northern Hemisphere, uh, we, we see that the, the prices that we have to pay to publishers to get access to our own research is becoming uh, more and more difficult. And so we can simply not afford that or we are simply not willing to pay these huge amounts of money uh, to get access to the research of our own, uh, of our own people. And so in, in that sense, Latin America and the Caribbean really has been a, a pioneer for many years. And so there is this strong basis that we already have of, uh, of open access to publications. And also since a few years, um, we are looking here in Latin America and the Caribbean also at research data. Research data are every time more important, play an important, more important role in, in research. Um, and, and probably are going to replace uh, the formal publications as, uh, as we currently know them. And, and this is why in 2015 we started um, here in, in, in CEPAL with this project, the LEARN project, which uh, finished like two years ago now, but still is a reference in, in, in the region. Um, and the, the objective of this LEARN project was basically to disseminate good practices of research data management on the institutional level. And so uh, the way we've done this is by producing a toolkit with uh, case studies from Europe and from Latin America and the Caribbean um, of institutions that struggle with this issue of research data management uh, and, 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 and how they solve uh, these, uh, these issues. Um, we also have uh, produced, in the context of this project, a model policy, which is uh, not an abstract thing, because this is a document of, um, of two pages. Basically, um, we've taken um, several policies that exist, real policies that exist in, in several institutions, in, uh, especially in Europe, because in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are not many uh, research data management policies. We've taken these and we've identified the common elements and the differences. And, and so based on, on these real policies, we've kind of, um, um, produced a, a template that institutions, research institutions who are interested in implementing a research data management policy can use and can change um, to their own convenience. Um, and uh, so this is uh, the LEARN project and, and all these materials are still openly available on, on the internet and you can, you can see the URLs there. Um, the, the, what I think is even more important than these documents that we've produced in the LEARN project is this community that we've created. And I think the first time in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there was a community and there still is this LEARN community that is rather active in, um, in research data management. 
And so we've organized several events um, all over the region and, and in Europe. And I think what really make, make, made this project interesting is that it was really an, an exchange of experiences between Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean. So um, the initial point, um, the, the starting point of the project was basically, okay, here in Latin America and the Caribbean, we can learn from Europe and Europe can learn from our experiences uh, in research data management in Latin America and the Caribbean. So that really made it um, a, an exchange of experiences on, as, as equals. So uh, the state of research data management in Latin America is that, well, uh, there's still a lot of, a little bit less than, than a few years ago now, but um, there is uh, still some confusion on, on terminology, open data, big data, scientific data, research data, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and this is uh, partly because it's, it's these, these uh, this terminology is, is fashionable, everybody talks about it, um, but in practice we see that very few institutions actually, um, I mean, on, on an institutional level have, have policies. So there is, and this is also something that we heard today in, the, in this webathon, there's a lot of research being done, there's a lot of data being produced, but this uh, kind of very much stays as on, on the level of the researchers. So this is kind of in, in many institutions a responsibility, seen as a responsibility of researchers. Um, and, and not very often there is a policy on, on this institutional level. And this is what we are uh, slowly but surely are trying to, uh, to change. Um, and there are, I mean, in, in Latin America and Caribbean important, uh, but rather isolated uh, experiences in research data management. Um, there are, and, and this is something similar that we've seen with, with open access in, in the beginning, there are still uh, too little incentives for data sharing. And, and this is something that uh, we've seen also with open access and then uh, this is a change of culture. And so this is something that is, uh, is gonna take some time. Um, we know we definitely need some training and, and skills in data science. Um, so I would say, especially on the level of libraries, for example, or ICTs, ICT unit, where people are supporting researchers if you want to implement a policy of research data management on the institutional level, you also need the people, you also need the skills to be able to support that. And this is very often uh, not, not yet the case. Um, so after, after the LEARN project, uh, what we've basically done is to, uh, to maintain this community, this LEARN community alive, and we've organized, and we are still organizing uh, workshops. Uh, actually next Tuesday, there will be a next uh, workshop. It's a virtual workshop, which will be about the data repository uh, at the University College in, in London. So if you are interested in, in joining this community and attending um, these uh, webinars, let, let me know, just write me an email and, and I'll send you the details so that you can uh, follow our community. So uh, we've also produced uh, these materials that are for free and available on the internet. This is um, a bibliogia, this is a kind of a manual of research data management. And so we try to cover there not only uh, the LEARN project, but many other things that have been produced uh, all over the world that are useful for institutions that are interested in uh, implementing a research data management policy. Um, we've also been uh, very active with the, another manual uh, on open science, which is a bit broader um, than, than just research data management. We've actually coordinated the uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish translation of the Foster Open Science Handbook. And so this is also available. You have the URL there. Uh, and, and so that covers, um, let's say, most of the, of the elements of um, open science. Um, just to, uh, to kind of zoom out uh, before I finish, why is, is all this important? 
Um, well, of course, because uh, we are talking about open science and we think that open science is, is better science. But the, the, the broad context of open science, open data and open access is, of course, access to information and knowledge as a human right. And access to information and knowledge has a prominent role in several uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, um, very prominent in 16, which is about uh, peace, justice, transparency, but also uh, as, as a concept in, in the other SDGs and in most uh, SDGs of, uh, of the United Nations. Um, and, and there's a lot happening in access to information, um, the, um, the, there's a lot of uh, innovation happening. And what we see is that in the world, this innovation, uh, technological innovation, is still very much like artificial intelligence, for example, still very much the privilege of a few people and a, and a few uh, big companies like uh, Google, Facebook, etc. Um, that are playing a major role in those technological uh, advances. And we don't necessarily see that um, normal citizens are benefiting uh, from these um, technological advances, benefiting then as citizens, not just as consumers, because obviously everybody has a Facebook account, everybody has a Google account, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just, uh, as, as consumers. So uh, what I think is really, really important is that we researchers, libraries, um, um, make sure that uh, access to information and having the skills, digital literacy, literacy skills, to be able to manage those huge amount of, of data and information that is coming to us, that we are able to manage that, Ju not just as researchers, but, but especially as, as citizens. And, uh, and I think this is really the, the broader context of, um, of the, the, what, what it is about, access to information, access to data, and, and access to, uh, to science. Um, so data literacy crisis in, in a sense that um, there's huge amount of data, but most people do not have the skills, do not have the instruments to be able to manage uh, this huge amount of data. And so the question that was asked in, 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 in Fortune a few days ago was actually, can, can libraries be the superheroes in, in, uh, in this new world? So uh, open science is better science. Open science begins with respect, equality, diversity, inclusion, collaboration. Um, open science is about publication metrics and reward system that ensures that output is evaluated solely on its own merits and not on, on, uh, based on the journal where it is published and that is made available to the widest audience possible, including machine readable uh, formats. Uh, open science is important because it results in openness, transparency, more rigorous and higher quality research, innovation, and collaboration. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Walter. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to leave the questions uh, for the end of the session. So, Micah, do you want to continue? Sure, I'm ready to go now, if you all can hear me. Uh, try to speak again. I, I could. Hi. Micah? Hello. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Good. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and paste in the chat um, a, a link mm -hmm. to my uh, presentation notes so anyone can follow along. And really what I'm going to show is, oh, there you are. Uh, I'm going to show a, um, a bunch of uh, web pages that I'll click through. So hold on one sec. Let me get my Google Chrome. Going. You see my screen there? Yes. 
Okay, great. So um, I think it was really um, uh, great that, that Walter ended on kind of talking about the definition of open science, including things like metrics, rewards, and incentives. Um, uh, uh, what I'll, the frame of what I'll talk about today is this project that you're looking at here, Immersive Scholar. This is a, uh, a Mellon-funded uh, grant project that I'm the lead PI on here at um, North Carolina State University. Um, and it's, it's ostensibly about uh, visualization technologies and how and the scholarship that's produced within them. But uh, what I'd like to talk about is some of the opportunity that we've taken through this project to talk about how um, how to make uh, humanities scholarship more open. So uh, the idea for this sort of started at um, a long time ago, actually at OpenCon in 2017 in uh, in Berlin, where there was a group kind of pulled together to talk about what an open humanities would look like. Uh, we tend to use the phrase open science or open knowledge, um, and that, that's a helpful uh, phrase, but sometimes that does feel like uh, the humanities are left out. So there was a group gathered at OpenCon that, that started to, to think about open humanities, and that was continued, and what you see here on the screen, at the FORCE um, Scholarly Communication Institute in 2018, where myself and a colleague named Samantha Wallace uh, taught a course on how to, how to um, or we, we sort of gathered people together to have a conversation about how humanities could be made more open. Uh, all of this was coming together as a combination of my interests, a uh, kind of dual interests in uh, invisible labor, especially in the digital humanities, and the, the general concept of contributorship. How do we think about contributorship um, especially for things like digital humanities, which are often big collaborative projects. Um, I was uh, inspired to begin this, uh, I guess, this, this thought process through this um, issue of the Journal of Digital Humanities from, uh, from the fall of 2012 that focused on evaluation, like how do we evaluate the um, new forms of scholarship that are coming out of the digital humanities, and especially by uh, Bethany Novisky's essay that was included as part of that on evaluating collaborative digital scholarship or where credit is due. Additionally, and about a year later, two years later, this article came out from Roxanne Shirazi, and I'll just say again, all of these are linked in that um, document that I shared, so you can go back and find all of these, um, about the, the question of service and, and um, how uh, our librarians labor specifically valued in the collaboration of digital humanities, where we often are, or sometimes are, thought of as providing a service, uh, when sometimes maybe we're thinking of ourselves as, as more collaborators than service providers. Um, so that's, that's some of my interest in invisible labor. And then I um, am a big fan of uh, Cassidy Sugimoto and, and her um, work on um, acknowledgements and uh, contributorship, especially related to gender differences in science. Um, I had the opportunity to, to work with Cassidy on a kind of a, a week-long intensive project about thinking about use, how to use taxonomy to um, not quantify, but to identify different kinds of contributorship. So we'll, I'll get, come back to that point in, a, in, in the end. So this conversation has evolved for me over, I guess, five, six, seven years. Um, and I'll take a moment to plug this forthcoming issue of the digital, um, the digital Humanities Quarterly Journal on the topic of invisible work in the digital humanities, which came out of a conference that I was able to co-coordinate with my colleagues here uh, at Florida State uh, several years ago. So all of this has come together that my co combination of interests in invisible labor, contributorship, um, the uh, Roxanne Shirazi's idea of the documentary impulse and how documentation can be a form of, uh, of uh, how we think about evaluation and contributorship. Um, Dr. Sugimoto's work on acknowledgments and, and um, different ways of uh, valuing and, evalida and validating um, different people's work on a thing. At the same time, I was learning quite a bit about um, what I'll call uh, project documentation. So especially in the digital humanities, there was a time where there was a lot of talk about project management and a, a key part of that was um, defining terms, defining roles uh, through something like a memorandum of understanding, an MOU. 
Um, so my, my interest in documentation started to come out of this, uh, this work of um, Brett and Peace and Rafia from the University of Texas at Austin uh, and, and, and how, to, how to use MOU as project documentation that actually can create a better um, outcome for the project. More recently, I discovered this uh, project, the digital documentation process, which sort of outlines a, um, a framework for how to think really uh, deeply and uh, consciously about um, how we document projects to have them enter the scholarly record. What are the things that a, a digital humanities project might, or any, I guess any other kind of project might um, find valuable to, um, to create a sense of it as a scholarly object. So this project has defined these three things, a catalog record, a persistent identifier, and an archiving dossier narrative, a, a description of the project and pointers to where um, project assets live. So I've taken all those ideas and compiled them together and uh, am very interested right now in what happens between outputs, which is this sort of green or teal column here, what happens between outputs and formal publication, which is the, the gold over here. And I've sort of defined on this periodic table these two middle areas of documentation and scholarly sharing. Um, and so all of uh, those interests and in, in the, the um, research that I've been inspired by, um, the work around documentation and my evolving sense of that middle ground between something is finished and something is formally published have come together in the Immersive Scholar project. So where we're at right now with Immersive Scholar is uh, we are in begin, just beginning year three of a three-year grant. So we're, we're looking toward the end of the project. And the primary outputs, or, or maybe what was imagined as the primary outputs of the project are um, actual uh, large-scale immersive works of visualization. Uh, and those are, are linked uh, in this, in this um, site also. But because of all that background and because of the history and because of the uh, sense I have of conversations that are going on in the digital humanities right now, we've taken a really um, in, in, intentional um, decision to also make documentation a primary output for the project. So what you're looking at right here is the um, what we're calling the documentation hub for the project. So I showed you the sort of the project website there that will be updated to, to kind of include outputs of the project. But here is where the, um, yeah, the, more, the more nitty gritty uh, material uh, that actually contextualizes the project really well for, especially for our disciplinary community and in libraries and in the uh, adjacent digital humanities. So we made a conscious decision that the, another primary output of the project will be documentation. One of those really um, key parts of documentation is that we're developing what I'm calling a contributorship data model. And what you're looking at here is the human readable version of that. And this is written in Markdown. Um, and we're pulling terms from um, two taxonomies, from the credit taxonomy, the contributor roles taxonomy uh, developed by Kazrai and from Tadira, the Taxonomy of Digital Research Activities in the Humanities. And we're, we're pulling terms um, and made some really intentional decisions about how many, um, um, each, each person affiliated with this aspect of the Immersive Scholar Project, um, we apply two terms for each person, one from the Kazrai Credit Taxonomy and one from Tadira. And this is really just a thought exercise for us to explore a, a possible best practice for how to um, acknowledge contributions in machine readable way or in human readable ways. And I think uh, I won't be able to show it, but we're also developing a, um, a machine readable version of this same contributors file, contributors data model that will be a JSON file that's attached along with each aspect of the project. Um, some of the other um, Oh, that's the presentation. Some of the other uh, decisions that we've made uh, at Immersive Scholar are uh, we're also being very clear about uh, our contribution methodology. So there are questions, especially in the sciences, about author order, or how do you define um, is the, the corresponding author the one that had the most um, influence? 
So we have sort of spelled out in our documentation here in the documentation hub um, how we decided things like uh, contribution and author order. Uh, the final piece that I'd like to talk about is um, that we also are, we've developed these pre, um, pre-formed um, evaluation frameworks, best practices, some language, so that anyone who, for example, um, if one of our uh, project partners came and worked with us and then needed to make the case for this project being part of their promotion and tenure portfolio, um, we're providing as part of their project uh, documentation and part of their, their collaboration with us, um, a keywords document. And we worked with, um, we had a research assistant this summer named Dr. Abby Mann, who was a, a great colleague and looked across um, many different codes of how to evaluate digital scholarship and compiled this keywords document where anyone can sort of um, find a way to describe uh, their work on a digital project in ways that make sense for tenure and promotion committees. The last thing I'll show is that also Abby, um, uh, Dr. Mann developed a framework for te tenure and promotion committees that might be looking at a large scale or immersive visualization and trying to um, figure out how to evaluate it. Um, and so this is a really similar um, document to those keywords, but uh, aimed at a different audience. So this is a, a tenure and promotion committee that might not have faced this kind of material before. So basically, my my uh, my final point will be that we've just we've made an, um, uh, a lot of conscious decisions about how to frame documentation toward the end of um, illustrating contributorship and providing for evaluation of these new kinds of works because it's it's necessary and it's the work that libraries, um, uh, especially librarians, uh, can bring to uh, digital scholarship projects. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thanks, Micah. That was great. Thanks a lot. And I see that Thomas is here. Thomas, are you here? Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Great that you could make it finally. Yeah. Cool. So, Thomas, do you want to start now sharing your screen on your presentation and we leave the questions by the end of yours? Or your presentation for everyone. Sure. Yep. Happy to. Great. Let's see. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Okay, um, uh, so thank you for having me um, uh, here to speak with you all today. I, I super appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I, I, I really like the spirit of this event. It's like a really smart way um, to go about this. We should probably do this more, um, you know, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, my name is Thomas Padilla. I'm at UNLV. I'm also at OCLC Research. Um, I am going to talk about a project today called Collections as Data Part to Whole. Um, the URL there is at the, the bottom of this, of this first slide if you would like to um, learn more about the project uh, after this talk, and I hope that you will, because uh, that will mean that I've done my job well. Uh, our project, like Micah's project, is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, we very much appreciate their support. Their work would not be possible uh, without them. I am the PI on this project. Uh, I work on this project along with my um, collaborator, Hannah Skates Kettler, co-PI at Iowa State University, uh, Lori Allen, who has recently moved to the Library of Congress, and Stuart Varner at the University of Pennsylvania. The project is stewarded by a fantastic advisory board, um, all of these folks listed here at a, at a range of institutions doing great work. We appreciate uh, their advice and their guidance in this project. Um, I'm going to go into an, an overview of the, the part to whole project. 
Uh, I'll then talk about a couple of projects that we are supporting through our project. Um, that will make more sense, I hope, <laughs> in a little bit. Like, why are there all these references to all these projects? You know, what is the, what is the relationship here? I'm hoping that's going to become more clear. Um, and then I guess we'll open it up to, to Q&A uh, for the entire group. So Collections as Data Part to Whole um, is a project that has uh, arose in the wake of an IMLS funded project uh, in the United States called Always Already Computational Collections as Data. It ran from 2016 to 2018. Uh, had some of the same collaborators on this project, a couple of different ones, um, Hannah Frost, Sarah Potvin, and Elizabeth Russi Roke. One of the primary claims in that project was that, um, that essentially that the predominant way that cultural heritage have, cultural heritage institutions have gone about digitizing um, or working with born digital collections, the way that we've gone about making them available um, may not serve uh, someone who wants to work computationally with collections, you know, who wants to do text mining, network analysis, machine learning, uh, who wants to, uh, you know, work with artificial intelligence, that our disposition toward digitization or management of collections and development of interfaces that sort of emulate physical interactions with objects, um, the ability to have page turners or zoom in on really high quality images, um, that in some cases, you know, actually kind of get in the way of researchers who want to work with the collections computationally, um, who want to work with the um, collections as data. And so we have this project called Always Already Computational. It was about two and a half years uh, of activity. We planned to produce um, three outputs or three deliverables. We ended up producing uh, something like seven or eight. Um, a number of them are referenced here on this slide. Um, the first one is called the Santa Barbara Statement on Collections as Data. And that's sort of like a, um, uh, a set of uh, principles um, that have been developed iteratively with a range of different communities um, that sort of articulate uh, shared values um, and things that we want to strive for if we're thinking about um, developing collections that support computational research or that support computational work within our own cultural heritage institutions. Um, it's we felt that it was important in particular to have uh, a pretty strong focus on the ethical dimensions of this work. Um, you know, if only that we don't want to be replicating some of the, um, you know, terrible things that our colleagues in the private sector are getting into, say, with facial recognition. We want to do this work well, we want to do it ethically, we don't want to harm the communities that we serve. In addition to that, there are a range of other things that were produced in that project, uh, use cases, personas, um, theoretical and conceptual position statements, descriptions of methods, uh, recommendations of different ways to get started in the development of um, collections as data and a white paper. And the white paper and all of those things are on Zenodo. Uh, URL is there. I will share these slides uh, afterwards if, if you want to check out a um, uh, 180 page PDF. Uh, that, that, is, that is there for you. Um, at the end of that two and a half years of activity, we had really talked a lot with archivists and museum professionals and folks in libraries and disciplinary scholars about uh, the question of implementation. How do we develop, prepare, describe, and provide access to machine actionable collections? Um, the Mellon project what, that I'm talking about today, Collections as Data Part to Whole, really arose um, because we wanted to consider where the other foot drops, right? So, you know, assuming that more institutions start producing collections in this vein, uh, to what extent are we um, in a good position to support the use of those collections, right? Implementation is one thing, but okay, say we all implement it, then how do we sustainably support the use of these collections as a larger consideration beyond um, our hopes that we attach to a single digital humanities librarian or a single digital scholarship librarian, or if it's a better institutional situation and there's a whole department of digital scholarship, um, you know, many of us know that even a, a department dedicated to uh, an activity uh, like this is perhaps not very sustainable. So we uh, sought out Mellon's support um, and we have initiated a project called Collections as Data Part to Whole. It's a three-year project. It runs from 2019 to 2021. Um, the project is focused on fostering the development of broadly viable models that support implementation and use of collections as data. Um, 
the project, we re-grant the majority of the funds uh, that were granted to us to support 12 other projects in the production of an implementation model, a use model, um, and also a collection, uh, collections as data that speaks to underrepresented histories. Um, so again, three deliverables that we're expecting these regranted projects to produce, um, a broadly viable use model. Um, so this would be, uh, you know, essentially the collection of uh, position descriptions, relationships, um, percentage allocations of time that it takes, uh, hopefully across departments. We're really interested in sort of cross departmental collaborations that kind of like fuzzies those siloed relationships um, and that ultimately produces a model that other institutions can learn from um, to support the use of collections as data. Um, we are also hoping for the production of an implementation model. So again, this is sort of similar to the use model, the collection of descriptions of duties, allocations of time, but also expands to consider description of infrastructure, access to code, um, and so forth. And finally, a machine actionable collection or collections as data should be produced that speaks to um, underrepresented histories. Uh, we all know that um, there tends to be a, a certain pattern of resources allocated to uh, the creation of collections um, that does not do our underrepresented communities justice. And so we want to try and do our small part to encourage a diversification of collections that are available for use. Um, in terms of project design, we have required that uh, each of the teams that receive funds have a senior administrator, a project lead, and a disciplinary scholar. Um, the disciplinary scholar is there to basically um, kind of vouchsafe or, or, or um, reinforce um, the, um, the likelihood that the data that is produced in the project will be used, either for research or pedagogical purposes. Um, the project lead manages the day-to-day -day work of the project, and the senior administrator um, you know, is essentially that person that has the levers to sort of clear the path for the project to be successful, especially because we're encouraging folks to work across different parts of an organization. Um, we want that senior administrator to help uh, basically bridge different parts of an organization to make the project successful. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, project samples. Uh, you know, we have a cohort of six teams. Um, there are different kinds of institutions. There is a historical society, there are research universities, um, and there is a art museum as well. Um, when we were thinking about uh, supporting the development of these implementation and use models, um, you know, we wanted diversification in our cohort because um, we realized that different institutions have differing amounts of resources, different communities that they serve, um, and different capacities, right? So we didn't want to support the production of one implementation model and one use model. What we wanted instead was a number of different kinds of models that a number of different kinds of organizations could learn from and possibly adapt to guide work at their institution. Um, so just really quickly, the first example I would talk about is from UNC Chapel Hill. It's called On the Books, Jim Crow and Algorithms of Resistance. Um, the project is aiming to make North Carolina legal history accessible as a text corpus. Um, you know, they're applying a number of different computational methods in, in order to make this happen. The part that uh, I would highlight about this um, is sort of the organizational component, um, you know, that, that we like to see. Uh, it's kind of evident in the list of the project team members. So you, you have folks in special collections, you have folks in research services, you have um, faculty member uh, from the Department of History. Uh, and so you have, you know, sort of like this matrix collaboration that's pulling resources from all across the organization in order to make this happen. So we see that as a really encouraging sign. Um, the second example I would talk about, it's the last one, it's from the University of Denver. It's called Uncovering History, focused on um, supporting uh, uh, OCR for um, handwritten medical records. Uh, you know, some of the deliverables in this project are, are the trans transcriptions um, and a reproducible pipeline. Uh, an important deliverable of this project as well that is not described in this slide is um, sort of a, a model or a framework um, for making sure that if you are trying to do a project like this, say with medical records, that it is done ethically. Um, this team has done a wonderful job in terms of engaging um, ethics experts, 
uh, legal scholars and historians. It formed them into an advisory board, um, and they've been working really hard with them um, to es essentially establish a model for other institutions to follow if they, if they want to work in a space like this. Um, the other part that I really like about this project is, again, is that they're thinking about their work as a model. And you can kind of see this um, on this particular slide where they have you know, archives, libraries, humanity scholars, a public um, in the libraries, and they have sort of inputs and outputs that sort of frame how everyone will collaborate um, in order for something like this to happen. So timeline for our project. Probably the most uh, useful thing for this audience to know is that our first cohort will release their implementation and use models and collections in April of 2020. Um, so those will be out in the world uh, for the world to learn from. And then in cohort, the cohort two models and collection release will happen in April of 2021. So I think I probably went over time. Um, I have more to say, but um, I'm gonna save that for the, for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That was great. Thanks a lot. Um, so now we have maybe a little less than 10 minutes for questions. Do we have any question here? From the people who are here in the in the in the room? Well, I have a question and a, and a kind of comment for the three of you. Maybe now you can also type the questions. Remember, I can read them. Um, first, from what Walter uh, presented, I, I was thinking that Walter, um, the idea of this of of the of of this uh, webathon today is is very much related to to the learn project. When we were thinking about this, we were thinking about how we could learn from each other, people who maybe are in the north, in the south, in different places in the world, and making use of technology, but in a in a way that can help us um, bring knowledge uh, together in in a different way that sometimes is not related to moving to traveling to conferences and paying registrations and all these things. Um, and I I have one question or maybe a comment for Micah and another from for Thomas. Um, one thing, Micah, how uh, how do you think this um, this taxonomy is about giving as you were explaining, giving credit to people um, and to their work uh, inside projects um, can help also seeing um, how people are working inside libraries. In, in previous sessions, we were discussing a little bit how to move from this idea of services in the libraries, but seeing uh, libraries as a place for, um, uh, for collaboration, for collaborative work, for um, opening work to other places. So how do you think that all these taxonomies you are using, not only the Tadira, but also credit, that I think that it's a really uh, important thing, uh, can, can not only uh, help improving how we work in the age, but in, in libraries as a whole. And, and then Thomas, um, if, if then you can tell me uh, something that maybe I, I didn't get it or, uh, or maybe you said it, but uh, if you can tell me then, who is, is, is has uh, the students or people from outside the university started using um, these uh, collections in a specific way? Because I was thinking that um, uh, this can also not, not only make students work better for maybe their PhDs or, um, <laughs> Um, but also improving how we work in the digital humanities with public humanities or citizen science and how did you see this? So these are my two questions for you guys. Can I go first, Thomas? <laughs> um, to respond to the question, Jimena, I think that um, by, by using these taxonomy, which are, you know, controlled vocabularies, which are never going to encapsulate everything that libraries do on any kind of project. 
it just gives us the opportunity to increase our visibility. And um, as, as weird as that might be, I think that that, um, that can translate to value. Uh, I, I don't necessarily like the, the, that that's true, but if we can find ways like using a, a, a taxonomy like Kazurai Credit or Tadira um, to communicate to our partners what our work actually means. So when I say data curation, here's two sentences that Tadira has defined as what data curation means. Um, I hope that, that that creates some visibility for our, our, our faculty partners. And then, um, and this is like my, my overall goal for my career at, at, in libraries and, and in digital humanities. I think that it will, and I hope that it will um, engender a, a perception shift that generally um, libraries and librarians can be thought of in, in different ways because we're able to more clearly define um, our value uh, in different ways, but using um, language that makes sense and is like clearly defined based on these taxonomies that came out of various disciplines. So that, that's my hope. I, I think what we're trying with Immersive Scholar is to see if we can nudge that forward a little bit. And I'm, I'm anxious to see um, what other projects might be doing work like that also. I love the periodic table. Is that yours? Yeah, that's an idea that I've been playing around with for, for years, but uh, feel free. It's, it's CC by license, so feel free to translate okay. and use and yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so with respect to the, um, like our, our project, the Collections as Data project, um, like how students have been using it, uh, it's sort of early days for the re-grantees. They, they started in January, so they're about halfway through their project. Um, but uh, there are a, a couple of different um, plans uh, in that space. So for example, the um, North Carolina example, the making the legal, legal data corpus, mm -hmm. um, you know, part of the aspiration there is to, um, is to use that data at the, um, at the high school level in the state of North Carolina um, to uh, educate high school students about the legal history um, of segregation um, in North Carolina. Um, and there's another project in our cohort at the University of Pittsburgh where it's actually focused on taking um, descriptive metadata from uh, a collection, rep you know, related to an underrepresented community, bringing it into the classroom and having undergraduate students um, uh, enrich the description um, in a way that, that better speaks to the history of the people that are represented in the collection. And then the library actually reincorporates the description um, into the catalog. So it's sort of interesting because like it, it, it engages students in the collection, um, but it also like makes some headway on like a library developing a process to take potentially actually like take data back from research community or student community, which I think is kind of kind of an elusive Kind of an elusive thing, right? Like I feel like we had, you know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, we had a lot of like folksonomies were like the really cool thing and like tagging and, um, and then libraries and museums were just like, Ugh, like, what is all this stuff? Like, I don't know what to take and some of it's junk. And uh, <laughs> so I feel like there was like a backlash that happened where uh, a lot of our institutions have been really hesitant to uh, incorporate data that is not produced within like the special confines of the institution when you know the reality is that we have a lot of researchers in the digital humanities where much of their projects are essentially generating structured data um, and then there's nowhere for it to go. Mm -hmm. go to a repository sure right repository maybe like institutional repository or data repository but it could also be repurposed just to uh, increase uh, access to the collections I don't know um, so early days, but some things are happening. Great, super. Any questions here? Okay, um, it might happen that people make questions by Twitter or after we finish these presentations because we're going to share all these presentations also in some events that we have here in, in Argentina in this and next year. So, and we're going to upload these videos to our channel. So um, thanks a lot for being here and for participating. It was great. We're also going to write to you because we're going, if you want, we are going to open a, a repository for the presentations in our Zenodo repository of our association. 
So thanks a lot for being here and participating, Walter, Micah, and Thomas. And thanks to the people who were here listening to you too. And hope to see you all soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.